Well, I want to welcome you to the Hills Church at home or wherever you are viewing this. As I say, each and every week, um, you have the opportunity to go to our website, hillschurcharcadia.org, download the message notes, uh, particularly today, download those message notes because there's several scriptures that I won't get a chance really to go over that it's important for you to go over later. Hey, and download the kids activity sheet as well. They can stay engaged as you are listening to this message. Hey, and I want to encourage you. Uh, we've been mentioning to follow along in the one year chronological Bible. In fact, we're already almost through the book of Exodus. And oh, it's always so interesting that even though we're right now in the Old Testament, that these things would come alive even in a message today that we're primarily looking at the New Testament. But that's what God does. He's new every morning. So I encourage you, you can get all the information at our website. You can download it on your uh, phone, your tablet, or you can print off a PDF uh, as well too. I encourage you to do that. Well, if you would, grab uh, your Bibles. And um, let me first mention this before we get into the scripture. I'm not going to read all of Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 26 but it's important that you read it. My prayer today, in fact, I, I think sometimes my role as a pastor is to whet your appetite so that you are hungry for his word, that you are hungry for his word. I can't in this short period of time hit on everything that we're going to hit on. In fact, I feel like sometimes we just gloss over it. But that's where the Holy Spirit takes the teacher and he kind of fashions it to your particular heart. But I so encourage you to go back, read over these scriptures, look at the details in the Bible that was left for us. But we want to look today primarily at uh, really what I think Jesus is given an illustration of in Mark 11, the power that he's going to talk about through uh, his ministry and uh, prayer life of the disciples and to us, and no power, which is what those leaders turn that temple into. So let's come before the Lord today and let's, let's pray, let's settle ourselves, and let's ask the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, to teach us in all of these things. So Father, I pray for all of us, and wherever anyone is listening, Holy Spirit, teach us today the power of your words in our heart. Uh, show us that Jesus wanted to direct us to the power that he was talking about to have faith in God. Those four words that are so important, have faith in God. And we receive it today in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to pick up and I want to read. In fact, I'll put the verses on the screen. I want to pick up after Jesus curses the fig tree, we talked about that the last couple of weeks, after he's cleared out the temple. Now, remember uh, the temple, we'll go through that in a little bit. The temple is where the presence of God is, yet those leaders have turned it into really a marketplace to make money. It has nothing to do with that worship unto God. They're making money. And Jesus is going to show a comparison in the verses that I read about power using our prayer and using his name. In fact, it says this in Mark 11, verses 20 through 26. The verses are on the screen. Now in the morning as they passed by, Jesus and the disciples, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Interesting. They see the fig tree dried up and Jesus's first words are have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain be removed and to be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done and he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask 
when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, back. oh, let me come back to that verse in just a minute. Believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Now, if we were to go back, and I, and I want to mention this for just a little bit. If we were to go back and look at the temple, in fact, here's, here's what really hit me this week as we were reading through Exodus, is the detail that God instructed through Moses, through Aaron, who would be the high priest, through the Levites, and those, the masters that were brought in to uh, build the tabernacle. Now, when I mention the word tabernacle in the book of Exodus, really the tabernacle was a portable temple. And it would be moved around as they uh, as they moved as the Lord led. So it was a portable tabernacle, but the Lord wanted it built a specific way. Well, as we've been reading in the book of Exodus, all of a sudden another piece that's built into the temple is what we what is, the Bible refers to as the Ark of the Covenant. Now, many of us will remember the Ark of the Covenant, but we've got to get that example out of our mind. We only think of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And we think of Indiana Jones and we think of him saving the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is now hid somewhere in some warehouse. We got to get that out of our mind. We got to go back to the Bible. But you know, as I was going through this and I was going through these teachings, Jesus says something early on in the book of Mark. Let me switch to that. The book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 13, that I think is so important before we move forward. It's indicative of what was taking place at the temple, and really it should have nothing to do with our relationship with him. In fact, he said this. This is out of uh, the modern English version, that you're making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and you do so many similar things. You're making the word of God of no effect from your tradition. Remember this, that in Isaiah chapter 55, we get a picture that the word of God does not return void. Yet Jesus talks about that the word of God is not active because of the traditions of men, or over time, things have come a tradition rather than that fresh relationship with him. Rather than what Jesus said to the church in Revelation, you've lost your first love. So when we're reading all of these scriptures, I, I was going back in the book of Exodus and I, and I look at that Ark of the Covenant. And remember, most of the time, the Ark of the Covenant, if you read, and that's why I was saying you've got to go back and you've got to read this. The Ark of the Covenant stays within the tabernacle, you know, that moving temple. And then later it would be placed in the temple. Throughout all of Israel's history, and here's what I think is so important, the Ark of the Covenant is on, on the move. The Ark of the Covenant was constructed in such a way that it was uh, also a place where Moses would meet with God to hear from God. But in the Ark of the Covenant, in fact, I want to pull out in a minute a few things. Inside the Ark of the Covenant what do you think God would want put in there? You know, this is kind of that, uh, the ark where his presence resides. What do you think God would want put in there? Well, there were three things that we read in scripture that were put in there. There was a, a gold jar that had manna, and that was the food that God fed the children of Israel for, for 40 years that he brought down from heaven for them. There was Aaron's rod which Aaron's rod uh, had a bud. In fact, we know this, it budded, and then this, the blossom became an almond. And then there were two stones, and they're ju they just weren't two ordinary stones. They were actually the two stones of the Ten Commandments. Interesting, the elements put in the ark. Manna, which showed God's provision, which the people complained about having to eat manna. Aaron's rod that budded, which the people were against him being the high priest. And basically, this was that challenge of them all placing down a rod and Aaron's budded and then that blossom became an, um, uh, an almond, which also shows that the people were rejecting who God chose in his authority. And then the Ten Commandments, which was 
uh, the law to put in for the people to follow God's standards. Now, the Ark of the Covenant also had miracles with it. The Ark of the Covenant we read in Joshua chapter 3, the uh, as they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and they went into the Jordan River before they crossed into the Promised Land, the Jordan River stopped upstream so the people could cross, and that's the place where they all put the memorial stones in the bottom of the Jordan River to remember that they crossed. But the moment they went in with the Ark of the Covenant, the Jordan River stopped. The Ark of the Covenant was carried around Jericho all of the six days and then on the seventh. And the walls of Jericho fell down as God commanded that they shout and blew trumpets. So we notice that it was used, that it had miracles. In fact, uh, it was also shown that you did not touch the Ark of the Covenant like what happened back in David's day. Other recorded events about the Ark of the Covenant, it was captured by the Philistines. They took it and put it in front of their god, Dragon, and in the morning their god had fallen down. They put the god back up. The next morning it had fallen down. They moved the Ark to another city. The people broke out in tumors all over. They took it somewhere else. They broke out in tumors. In fact, some of the other translations said all the people had hemorrhoids. Well, we won't go too deep into that, but they finally got rid of the ark because all of the people were struck with these tumors. And we know that last part we read about it, 50,070 people died after trying to peek into the ark. And then one of the last things that we read is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, as David brings the ark back into Jerusalem, he is dancing around. In fact, that's where you remember he's dancing around and his wife looks down and, and really, really probably chastises him. And that's where we get that famous phrase, well, you haven't seen anything yet. But as we read in scripture, in fact, I wanted to pull a couple of these verses out. This is in Exodus chapter 26, and it's verse 31 and 33. And this is talking about the description of the tabernacle, where the ark was going to be placed. And Exodus says this, you have made a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic de design of cherubim. And you shall hang it in the veil between the, from the clasp. Then you shall bring in the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and and the most holy. We read this in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 35, verse 3. It says, And he said to the Levites who taught all Israel, who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. It shall no longer be a burden on their shoulders. They were carrying the whole thing around. Now serve the Lord your God, all you people of Israel. So we know that that ark was placed behind the veil. We know that the high priest would go behind the veil only one time a year. He would take in the blood of the sacrifice. And I want you to go back and I want you to read all of that. We don't have time to go through every little detail. But the high priest, Aaron, would have to go in. In fact, he would wash his body. He would put on that uh, sacramental robe. He made sure they had everything that God had designed it. He went in with a rope around his waist and bells on his robe so that they would hear him because if there was any sin in his life, he would drop dead and the rope was to drag him out. How would you like to be Aaron going into that Holy of Holies? You'd want to make sure that there wasn't anything out of place in your life. And you know, the last place in the Bible that we read about uh, the Ark of the Covenant really is in Jeremiah chapter 3. In fact, Jeremiah's prophecy expands to where King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and destroyed Solomon's temple. So if you can get a picture of the tabernacle being on the move, the veils and everything that are built, everything as you go back and read, God said, now Solomon builds a tabernacle, uh, uh, a temple before the Lord a place of worship. He brings in the Ark of the Covenant there. And then somewhere around 586 BC, it is completely destroyed 
But Jeremiah prophesied about that. In fact, he said this, then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. Let me read that again. So he's prophesying about that day, but it's interesting that this is talking about the heart of the people. That the heart of the people, it's saying, it shall come to pass when you are multiplied. And it increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it. It shall be made any more. You know, when we read that, we don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. We know Indiana Jones didn't find it. We know that it's not in some warehouse. We, we really don't know, except there's one scripture that may give us a little bit of hint. And we read that in Revelation chapter 11, verse 9. And it says, then in the temple of God, this is in heaven, then in the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in the temple. And there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Hey, maybe, just maybe, before it was destroyed, God took that Ark of the Covenant. Or maybe, just maybe, God had something new, something built that was new. But I wanted to read those scriptures to you because I wanted, wanted you to have in mind that we just had mentioned about a temple in Jesus' day. That wasn't a place of worship. It had turned into what Jesus said and what Jeremiah said was a den of thieves. It had nothing to do with the worship of God. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't in there, but the presence of the Lord was behind the veil. And as we read in the Bible, we read it in the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, and the book of Luke. We read when Jesus died, it says this, Matthew 27, 50 through 53, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple torn into from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the grave after the resurrection and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. The veil that was constructed to be a separation. And why was there a veil? That's, that's the question. Why was there a veil from the presence of God to the high priest, to the people? Because sin, back in Genesis chapter 3, sin caused the separation. There was a separation. And God constructed the tabernacle. God constructed it to have this separating wall between the people and him because of sin. And even the sacrifices, even that sacrifice on the Day of Atonement that you read about in Exodus, that sacrifice was not a paid in full for the sin. It was a covering. It was something that was an acceptable sacrifice, but there had to be one that would become the sacrifice of sacrifices. And Jesus comes in and he sees this fig tree having leaves and no fruit and he curses it. And he goes right up into the temple, the place of worship for the Passover. And the worship is not going on. It's a den of thieves. It's a marketplace for money. It's not a place of worship. His father's presence dwells within that temple. There's a veil in that temple. There's a separation between the people. And instead of those leaders bringing people into the presence of God and the worship of God and remembering those things, it's shown that it's turned into some elaborate business. And Jesus then shows this contrast that we read about in Mark chapter 11, after the disciples saw that the fig tree dried up, and he starts with those four words, have faith in God, that I believe he takes their eyes off of that scene 
and turns them back into the power of God, how they pray in their faith in the God Almighty. And what Jesus does when he says on the cross, it is finished, as we just read, that veil in the temple, which some Bible scholars feel was either 40 or 60 feet high, it was possibly four inches thick, braided, ripped in two to show that the presence of God was no longer behind a veil, that that very presence of God was to be active in the hearts of the believers that accepted him. In fact, I love what the book of Acts says in Acts 17, 24. It says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, notice what it says, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Go back and read Exodus and all the, I mean, you talk about the craftsmanship the artistry, the artisans that's used in building out the tabernacle and all of the elements and the Ark of the Covenant and all of that had to be, be able to be picked up and to be moved and to reset up. And Solomon comes in and he builds a temple and it's destroyed. And then later King Herod picks up and he wants to build this temple. In fact, he probably adds on to it to show his architectural uh, uh, experience and what he desired. And yet, when Jesus said it is finished, that veil ripped. And I love the image of Matthew. He takes us from the cross. It is finished. We get jettisoned to the temple where the, the, the uh, very veil is ripped into. The presence of God goes out. Then he takes us to places wherever there were graveyards that those that had died had risen up and were walking around. And then he takes us back to the cross to a centurion that says... You are the son of God. The book of Hebrews, which I encourage you to read even more, though I can only hit a few verses here. Hebrews 10, 20. By a new and living way, he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Nothing made from human hands, but the veil that is, is his flesh. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore, let us, we can do this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The high priest once a year would enter in. Now we're told, enter in boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy. You know, we read in Hebrews chapter 9. Let me read this as our last verse today. Hebrews chapter 9. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. You know, as we read these scriptures, again, I go back to that imagery of Jesus going through that temple probably a second time early in John, and then we read later here in Mark, that a place of worship that was made by human hands was to be a place where people found God, found forgiveness in God, had a place of being taught. And he wants to pull the disciples out of that. And he wants to teach them to have faith in God. Not in a religion, but in a life-giving relationship. And we're learning upon learning upon learning all of the ways that he's teaching us. If I could say anything to you today, I would say, please print out these notes. Please go back and read Exodus. Read back through the crucifixion. Read in Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 10. Allow the word of God to come on the inside of you so strong that you get a picture of how far, how deep, and how wide God went to send Jesus for you. In fact, even as I was studying it this week, of every detail he made sure he fulfilled so nothing was left out, so that nothing could be thrown out, 
he fulfilled it all. In fact, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you've been in a season where what we would say you've backslidden, you've walked away, you've rejected him, I encourage you. I pray for you that you would receive him. It's the most important prayer that you'll ever make. You know, it, it seems like every day we're reading headlines of people that whether they're young, middle-aged or older that, that are passing away of names that we know. And I always ask myself, I wonder if they knew Jesus because it was the most important decision, the most important prayer, and the most important walk. He came to give us life and that much more abundantly. Would you pray this prayer with me? It's taken out of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Pray this with me. Believe it in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. Dear God, I believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for me. I accept him as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins. And today I begin my relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. In fact, if you prayed that today, you've made that decision, I would so encourage you if you would reach out to us, whether on the social media, media platform that you're watching, whether going to our website to connect, so important, and read the Gospels. Allow those Gospel words to get in your heart. Well, as we read our, as we receive our tithes and offerings today, I want to read a couple of verses out of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11. And it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and earth and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all things. Both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. You know, we read about that manna being in the Ark of the Covenant it was that reminder to the people that God was their provider. Can I encourage you today that in all that you receive and all that you have, that we, we look and we say, we're his stewards. He is our provider. And as we give today, we thank God that he is doing the continual work and looking out after us and protecting us. Pray this with me today, would you? As I give in today's offering, I acknowledge that God has supreme dominion and authority. I am dependent upon his grace and power of almighty God. I'm just passing through on this planet, a steward of which God allows me to manage. God is the righteous owner of all things. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. In fact, if you're giving today, you can go to our website. You can click on the give button at hillschurcharcadia.org. It's safe. It's fast. It's secure. If you'd like to uh, mail in your tither offering, you can do so to the Hills Church, P.O. Box 661419, Arcadia, California. And the zip code is 91066. Boy, I so encourage you. I've said it three or four times. Go back, print off these notes. Go through every scripture. Be a, a hungry disciple today that wants to go and see everything that God did, that Jesus wants us to have his power. But he showed the disciples a place that should have had the power, but it had no power. And the power was when they took a hold of those four words, have faith in God. And as we do each week, we read Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I look up to the hills, but where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We're praying for you today. We are so appreciate you when we command and, and declare God's blessing over you, your family, in all that you do, especially 
today in this week. In Jesus' name, amen.